will come a day in the new heavens and the new earth and the renovated, in the reclaimed, in the renewed, in the restored earth when you will be functioning at full capacity. No more death. No more tears, no more cancer, no more spina bifida, no more discouragement, no more destruction, no more backbiting, no more jealousy, no more envy, no more deceit, no more fractured relationships, no more fear. Could we just let our imaginations run a little bit in what life might be like in a renovated universe purged of all evil with the people of God purified and perfected forever in his unhindered presence, experiencing only joy. This is a place you want to be. Now, when we read the book of Revelation, we need to remember a few things, and I I talked about this a week or two ago, but we're reading apocalyptic literature, and so there's wild imagery, and we're reading a prophetic uh, literature, so it's talking about future things, but we're also reading a letter. First and foremost, Revelation is a letter, and we tend to read Revelation, the book of Revelation, and it's like, my my goodness, there's these wild pictures of beasts and horns and covered in eyes and oceans and and, and, and crazy battles and like a a whore, and that's about all we can figure out. You know, it's like, this is kind of a crazy story, you know? And we tend to view Revelation, if we forget how to read it, we view it as like, like a graphic novel w- without the graphics. It's like, this, it's, like, it's like the Marvel comic book of the Bible, right? It's just, just kind of weird and crazy and like a superhero or two and a really bad guy and then there's a wedding and then it ends. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so if we misunderstand uh, uh, how it's being written, we, we, will, we will not be able to apprehend the purpose towards which it was written. And so we need to remember that it is a letter <clears throat> which means it was written by a person to a people with a purpose. And if we forget that, we'll think it's this incomprehensible mystery that, 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 that must you know, be saved for the seminary students. And we forget, no, no, this was written by John to the church with a purpose. And the purpose was to buoy their faith and to give them a sense of fortitude that could face persecution. And we know that, in fact, that was the case because soon after receiving this letter, there was a wave of persecution that moved across the Roman Empire, uh, instigated by the emperor himself against Christians, so much so they were being tortured and killed for their faith, which means on the brink of persecution like the church had never known, God wanted to say something to the people, and he wrote this letter. And so I want us to kind of sit with that a moment because it's easy to read Revelation and go, this doesn't make any sense. Why, why, why is this here? It's, it's kind of it's a mystery to me and move on. And if we don't understand how to read it, we'll miss the purpose of it. And there's a lot here for us. It, nothing is written in the Bible just to know. It's like, yeah, there'll be a test at the end. Make sure you know it. Nothing is written like that. The Bible is written, it's, it's, a, it's a practical book. It's written for us where we're at right now. And so let's just picture that like the White House turns upside down and there's a coup and democracy gets completely flipped on its head and, and martial law is declared and it is now illegal to serve Jesus and they are hunting you down with drones and your cell phone and they're, and they're, and they're looking, all folks who went to Gray City Church or whoever you know, you know, did a, a, a charitable tax write-off to a church and they're finding you somehow and they're droning your location and they're, and they're, ap- they're taking you and, and they're dragging you to the town Toyota Center to feed you to lions they flew in from South Africa who they had not eaten in a week. Like, like, like that's, that's the precipice that the people stand on that received this letter. Which means there must be something in here for us that maybe we've missed before. Because what we know is true in history, it's an inar- inarguable fact, the church of Jesus Christ faced persecution with unflinching courage and unflinching hope and unflinching and unwavering Faith. They had been given something. They had been deposited something inside their soul that was so deep and so heavy and so grounding they could get drug into the arena and die inch by inch at the hands of lions and not be moved. Which means if you feel you're being thrown to the lions at work, or you're being thrown to the lions at school, 
Are you being thrown to the lions in your marriage? There's something in here for you. And let's just be honest, however bad work may be or school may be, like, it, it ain't real lions. Like, this word buoyed people being torn limb from limb by, rawr, like real lions. If you get what's going on here, you can face tomorrow. You can face tomorrow. And so we want to take a look at this text. I'm going to read it for us just so we can get it in front of us and see some of maybe the challenges and the nuances that are here. And then we're just going to move in together. So chapter 21 Verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone like the, with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear and as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were uh, three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, and its gates in its walls, the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall, this work gets crazy. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh Jacinth and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. What in the world is he talking about? I mean, seriously, right? It's like, that's great. And it made no sense. But we know that it was understood by those who first received it. So, what is going on here? A couple things to help us get into this. The title of, our, of my, my sermon this morning is This Is Us. This is us. Now, I've heard there's a TV show out there called this, and so I'm not meaning to co-op that, but I think it's a good title for this sermon. So if the TV show is great and helps you connect with the sermon, great. If it doesn't, I don't care. I've never seen it. But this is going to be a good sermon, okay? This is us. Now, Revelation 21, 9 through 20, uh, uh, 21 that we just read, this is our World Series moment. So a few weeks ago, I talked about how to read Revelation and understand it in that it is, it is an event that's taking place, but not necessarily in a linear form. So you watch the World Series, and you see a bang, bang play, and it's like, that was incredible, but what, was he out? Was he safe? What actually happened? And then what happens is they, whoop, they rewind it, and they show you that same event from multiple camera angles, and they slow it down so you can see what actually happened that you missed in the blink of an eye in real time. So it's like, bang, bang, oh, what happened? Wow. Multiple camera angles, same event, slowed down so you can see the particles of dust and the sweat off the face and the tag split second before he touched the face. Oh, he's out. You can see more things when you have different angles and it's slowed down. That's what's happening here in this text. If you look at chapter 21, verse 9, he says, come with me and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Where have we heard that before? Same chapter, verse 2. Look at verse 2 in this chapter. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then he goes on. What's happening here? We're going to now see what he described in one verse in the first part of the chapter, now described and explained over 11 verses. He's taking the same verbiage, the same words, and he's saying, okay, I know I talked about it back there. Now we're going to circle back, slow things down, and you're going to see all sorts of things you didn't see when I just said it in one sentence. 
That's what's happening here in this text. Now, here's the big idea. The city of God is the bride of the Lamb. The city of God is the bride of the Lamb. That's the punchline. No surprise here. That's what I'm going to argue for. And if you're a new Christian or you're not a Christian, but you're checking this thing out, that would be easy for you to see. You'd read it and be like, well, yeah, he says it twice there, that he's going to show me the bride, and then he shows me the city. That would make sense. You wouldn't even need to know the storyline to connect those dots. And yet, if you've been in church a long time, this is confusing to you, and you might disagree because you had a lousy Sunday school teacher with bad flannel graphs, or you read a bad book and watched a dumb movie. Nothing against your Sunday school teachers. I love your Sunday school teachers. I had a great one too. But I'm saying there's been some lousy teaching on this text in the church for a while that has led us to think it's something that it's not. And if we understand something out of sync with what God intended for us to see, then we won't have and apprehend the purpose to which it was written. And it won't have the effect he intended to have in our hearts when he wrote it. And I know that to be true because most people are freaked out by the book of Revelation. And yet God wrote it as a letter to comfort his people. Something's off somewhere. This is us. This picture is us. The city of God is the bride of the lamb. I'm going to show you how so. John is comparing and contrasting two women in this text. Okay? And if you had read the story from, from left to right, chapter 1 to chapter 22, you'd see it. We haven't taken the time to do that. And so, it, understandably, you could miss it. But look at verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I'll show you a bride. Now, if you're reading this, realizing that the, the book of Revelation is heavy on imagery, heavy on illustration and metaphor, you'd be like, Seven, seven. I, I just read that somewhere. Oh, yes. And you would turn back to chapter 17 because we don't need newspapers to interpret Revelation. We use the Bible to interpret the Bible. We use the book to interpret the book. You go back to 17, verse 1, and you would read, oh, right, right, right. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. What's happening here? John is comparing two women, not two literal women, two metaphorical women, one representing the antagonistic humanity, its personification of those who have snubbed their nose and flipped off their finger at God saying, we don't need you. We don't like you. We don't believe in you. We're going to do our own thing. He's likening that group of people to whores. He's likening the rebellion against God and idolatry to prostitution. And this woman is, then, is contrasted over and against a second woman who is not a prostitute, a whore, a working girl. She is a virgin bride, pure, and whole. These aren't two literal women. These, these, are, these are metaphorical imagery representing the personification of two different kinds of people groups. One group rebelling against God, the other being saved by God. Babylon representing all of mankind who have rebelled against God. The new Jerusalem representing the new city, the, the purified city, the saved city of God. Pretty clear in the text. We're just making sure we're all on the same page, comparing the great prostitute to the bride. Why does John refer to the church as a city? Because he wants to emphasize that what's in view here is communal. The church is a new community, a new people. I mean, you cannot get saved to Jesus and not be saved into his family. And this is good news. Many of you that I know have gotten saved here or other places, your family's just kind of jacked up. I mean, the, 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 the parents are divorced, the dad's an idiot, the mom's lost somewhere, siblings are all on their own journey of dysfunction, and then God saved you, and you got a new family. You got a new heavenly father and a new better older brother in Jesus, and you got a new family of siblings. And it's like, my goodness, my new spiritual family is so much richer and better than my physical family, love them as I do, in, in their brokenness. In Christ, we get a new family. So heaven will not be this, you know, 
intrinsically individualistic experience. It will be intrinsically social. You will be there with the people of God. Why does John refer to the church as a bride? He wants to emphasize her radiant beauty and perfection. Why does John refer to the church as his wife? To emphasize the intimate union she has with the Lamb. All through Scripture, we see, we see Scripture connecting uh, uh, the intimate relationship a husband has with a wife inside the covenant of marriage to the kind of intimacy God longs to have with his family. You think, well, that's kind of creepy weird. No, 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 not sexual in nature, profound intimacy in nature. God gave the gift of sex as a gift to humanity to be experienced and enjoyed inside the covenant relationship of marriage as a shadow echoing something greater, namely his love for and relationship with his people. That's why there'll be no sex in heaven and no marriage to each other in heaven because there, the point to which the gift of sex was given will be being experienced, namely, wonderful, intimate union with God. Now, that's not, you're like, oh, that's weird. Well, grow up. This isn't a fuddy-duddy book here, people. This is a real book. And all through scripture, those who abandon God are, are, are when the people of Israel would like worship idols, you're like, you're whoring through the town. You have a a bridegroom, you have a groom who loves you, wants to protect you and guide you and meet all your needs, and you're running around every tramp you can get your hands on. You're like a whore. And he uses those graphic descriptions. Paul says, I'm preparing you like a bride for a groom to present you holy and blameless like a virgin. It's imagery, not speaking to the sexuality of, no, 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 speaking to, to the nature of the intimacy and the longing God has for his people. Relationship. We can't, we can't even wrap our minds around the kind of love he has for us. That's why John's using this, this imagery, this, these metaphors, for us to connect things that we know to things that we don't know and draw lines between for understanding. So our question this morning will be, what will the bride look like when hope is fulfilled? What will this is us look like when the hope of heaven, the hope of consummation, hope of reunion with the bridegroom is fulfilled. Number one, the bride will be safe, secure, and whole. Look at verse 12. Verse 11. It shone with the glory of God, that's the city, and its brilliance, namely the city, was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It, the city, had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. Now, if you were to identify modern day cities, how would you do it? What, what, what defines and gives identity to modern day cities? Exactly. Skyline. They're skyscrapers, right? So you can look at, at, at a silhouette of, of New York or the silhouette of Chicago or a silhouette of Seattle or a silhouette of San Francisco, and you could tell by, by the skyline, right, what city that is. In ancient world, the city was defined not by its skyline, but by its wall. The strength of the city, the, the, the richness of the city, the, the wisdom of the city leaders, the military strength and, 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 and readiness of the city was marked by its wall. Big wall, strong city. Puny wall, weak city. The wall not only defined the city, it also determined how safe the city was. Do you see in the text? It, was, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. Now, this is where it starts to get fun. As John's using imagery to communicate meaning, he's intending us to allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. See, we don't go to the newspaper. We go to the Bible and we think, hmm, a, a, a beautiful place of dwelling where there's, where, where it's, there's perfection and relationship with God and it, it, it has a gate into it being guarded by an angel. Where have I heard that before? Where? In the garden, that's right. In the garden. So if you don't know the story, you wouldn't connect the dots, but if you read the story left to right, God made this garden, this beautiful place of perfection where he was walking in the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, experiencing direct, immediate relationship, and then they sinned, rebelled against God. They had to be removed from the garden because there was only perfection in the garden. They were not now perfect because they had sinned against God. He removes them from the garden, places an angel at the gate to the garden to make sure No one unworthy would come in and partake of the tree of life. So too with this city. 
Look at chapter 21, verse 27, at the very end. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is a city that is safe and secure, simultaneously open to everyone. Now, in ancient times, they would build cities and gates, but they would not build a lot of gates because gates were weak points to be breached by the enemy. And so they were always the focus of the most defense because they were the target of the most pressure from the enemy because that's where you could get into the city. And so you might have one, two, maybe three at the most on one side. You'd never have a city surrounded with gates unless you could guard them. Because gates symbolically represented the way to get into the city. This is a city that is not only safe, being guarded by a great wall and gates with angels there. It's a city that's safe and secure and simultaneously open to and welcome to all who would come. Meaning no matter what side of the city you find yourself lost on, or no matter what side of the city you approach from after you wander off the trail, there are entrances and gates into the city staring you in the face. It's a safe city, a secure city, a city open to all. Why the 12 gates? Why the, 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 the 12 angels, the 12 foundations? The 12 apostles, the 12 names of the tribes. What's up with the 12, right? So it's like, like a Seahawks city, like, oh, 12s, woo! You know, like, well, what's this about? That's right. Why 12,000 stadia? Why 144 cubits? Look at the text. He measured, the, uh, in verse 15, the angel who walked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12 thousand stadia, follow this, in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. What's up with the 12s? What's up with the 12,000 stadia? What's up with the 144? If you have a Bible that translates that number into its English equivalent, throw it away. It's not helpful. I'm kidding. But if it, your Bible translated that for you out of ancient metrics into modern day metrics, you completely miss the point of symbolism. We're in Revelation, where he's already told us he's going to use imagery and symbolism to communicate meaning, not random symbolism. You, you in, insert your own meaning to symbolism consistent with the story throughout the text. And we know for a fact that all throughout the Bible, clue number one, John's burden of intent here is not mathematical or architectural, it's a symbolical. John's already told us, I, I, I'm not going to describe to you the, 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 the details, the architectural details of a city. If, if that was his intent, this is an absurdly shaped city. And his goal here isn't to do some like, you know, Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code crap novel stuff where you got to like connect the two and do the math and then read in the newspaper and then look at the spies and whatever and then like, no, no, no. Simple symbolism and imagery used throughout the scripture in this symbolic text. Clue number two, the city is not only a square, it's a cube. The geometric standard of perfection in the ancient world. Look at the text. Verse 15, or 16, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. It's a cube. It's in the shape of a perfectly geometric cube. What is the point of that? Where in scripture have you heard a cube described in detail before? It's measurements, precise and exact for the builders to get it right. Where else in scripture does a cube come into the story? Ah, the Holy of Holies. First in the tabernacle, then in the temple, symbolically representing perfection, 
that place where the spirit of God would dwell with his immediate manifest presence, Shekinah glory, and that place into which only one high priest could enter one time a year and only then with a breastplate of jewels, 12 in all representing the tribe of Israel and a rope tied to his leg unless the glory of God killed him and they could drag him out. That's the only other place in scripture where a cube is described. And now here we have this entire city of God being described with precise detail as a cube. The odd dimensions of God's new metropolis Or something more. Third clue. Throughout the entire book of Revelation, the number 12 and its multiples are symbolically used to speak of the people of God. 12 tribes, 12 apostles chosen by Jesus, 12 gates, 12 foundations, 12 angels. 12,000 stadia, 144 cubits, which happens to be a multiple of 12. What's the deal with the 12s? Very, very simply put, the city is safe and secure and populated by the full complement of the church in the immediate presence of God, or the city is nothing less than the full and complete expression of the people of God. This is us. This is us. Meaning when you get to heaven and you experience this moment of consummation, it will ignite and start the greatest, most epic intergalactic family reunion you have ever participated in. You don't have to Google your name and find out who your heritage is on earth. Abraham is in your story. Moses is in your story. Noah is in your story. Isaac, Jacob, Ruth, Jonah, if he made it. (laughs) These are your relatives. These are your family. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Stephen, Jeff, Becky, Doug, Helen, me, you, this is us. <laughs> when you get to heaven, you get to go find David and be like, David, love the songs you wrote, sang them all the time. Dude, I, I get the whole depression thing, me too sometimes. I'm like, but what were you thinking with Bathsheba, bro? Come on, dog. How'd the lion think of that? That was crazy. I mean, a eternity to begin enjoying The people of God, meaning your spiritual heritage and your family legacy is bigger than you've ever wildly imagined. This is us. This is the church being described as a city that's safe, secure, whole where the very presence of God dwells manifested in the immediate Shekinah glory of his presence, not distant, not momentary, not sometimes the steady, consistent presence of God experienced by the people of God in the new heavens and the new earth. Not a cubed city sitting on top of the North Pole. Good Lord. I Googled this actually, and there's all these corny pictures of, of, this, of this text. And it's like, it's like this square cube sitting on top of the globe. And because I'm not Carrie, I couldn't figure out how to get it on this TV. But if Carrie was preaching, you could see it and you could all laugh together. But because I'm the, the I'm 1.0 McPherson, right? So Carrie's like 2.0, they gets better as they go. So he, he could have done it for you. I can't have to imagine it. But if you Google this, there are a bunch of corny, cheesy pictures of people trying to figure out, well, we're going to live in a cube city somewhere on the globe and it's probably going to be over in the Middle East. And, and it's like, it's like, really? The new heavens, new earth has like walls. That you can't get outside. Like, well, I guess this is the end. Wow, that'd be cool to go over there. And then like we fly back into the center of the cube. Holy smokes, no. 
This is symbolically representing the safe, secure, perfected bride of Christ in the immediate presence of God in the new holy and holies, the new heaven and the new earth. What will the bride look like? Number two, the bride will be incalculably valuable. Look at the text. Verse 18, the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. Now, we have reference point for this, sort of. We know what gold is. We know what glass is. We don't know what translucent gold like glass is. So gold is like precious and heavy and pretty, and we like it, and we fashion it into rings and put it on our fingers, and we stack it in, in forts and, and use it to back up our currency, or at least we used to. You know? And so you know, we, we value gold. That gold's a big deal. And now it's here in this text saying it's there too. And we know what glass is. You can see through glass, and glass reveals imperfections. Think about what glass does. When you have glass, do I have my glasses yet? When you have glass, glass allows you to see the, the slightest imperfections. The reason I never wear my glasses is because my glasses are fogged and scraped and scratched and spotted. So when I put these stupid things on, it's like, whoa. You know, it's supposed to help me see, but not really, because when gr- glass is scratched, you, you can just see it plain as day. So, so I take them off, and, and I can see blurry things clearer, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Here, the city is made of translucent, gold-like glass, meaning if there were imperfections or spots or blemishes, you could see them. And there isn't. This is pure, this city is, this whole, look, it's the whole city. The whole city made of pure gold, pure as glass. And it says it again at the end of the text, The gray street of the city was as gold, as pure, as transparent glass. What's this saying? It's saying this city is valuable and precious beyond calculation, and it's pure. Now just start connecting dots. It's without blemish. It's without spot. It's without wrinkle. Hmm. Where have I read that before? This is not talking about a literal city, people. This is the prophetic fulfillment of Paul writing in Ephesians 5 saying Jesus will purify his bride so that she will be cleansed without spot, blemish, wrinkle. This is that fulfillment. He goes on. John's using imagery and metaphor not to describe an oddly shaped coming metropolis, but rather to illustrate the beauty of the bride of the Lamb. He's shattering paradigms to our present experience and pushing us beyond the capacities of first creation so as to communicate the unparalleled beauty and incalculable value of this city, the bride, meaning the new Jerusalem is not a place for a people, but rather a people for a place. The new Jerusalem as a city is the bride of Christ, the people of God, the church being brought down from heaven to rule in the new earth, her new home. This is us. Number three. What will the bride look like on the day of consummation? The bride will be gloriously, radiantly luminous. Now, I, I, I skipped some verses here. I, sh- I should back up quickly. Look at verse 19. The foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate. What's the point? He's he's identifying the very makeup of the city by these precious stones. He's trying to to communicate value, worth, preciousness. And then he gets to the end and he says, what what, what are the the gates made of? The gates are made up of pearls. Now, come on, folks. We know the pearly gates and all the jokes about St. Peter up there at the pearly gates saying yes to the people as they come in. Those are fine and great and, and, and whatever. But let's not miss the point. These aren't literal gates with literal 72-meter pearls that got harvested from some gigantic oyster somewhere the size of an apple warehouse making up the gate. It's saying the gate into the city is precious beyond calculation. Pearls 
were of great value in the ancient world, more so even than gold. Pearls were valuable more than their weight in gold. Jesus tells a story of the man who sold everything to obtain and secure the pearl with great price. Pearls were valuable. Pearls were intrinsically precious. What's the point? The gateway into this city is precious. What's the gateway into the city of God? It's not a pearl. It's a person, Jesus Christ. And his blood is precious. And his death was precious. And his resurrection was precious. This is a man beyond price. And when you look at the city, there are gates into the city. And the gate's names are Jesus. And you can get into that city from any side of the city you happen to come upon it. Not a literal city with gigantic pearls harvested from massive oysters. A precious city beyond value, gated by a pearl beyond greatest price. The bride will be gloriously, radiantly luminous. Look at, I skipped this. And now let's look at it. Look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. You read past that quickly and you, you, you miss the significance of it. It was mentioned as well in verse 2. Coming down out of heaven from God. Just say it slow. Coming down out of heaven from God. What's he saying? Here's the big idea. John's saying what you're about to see is the work of my hand. This bride you're about to behold, this city you're about to behold, is not the work of man's hands. It is the work of God himself, coming down out of heaven from God. What's the point? This is not the picture of a bride who has made herself lovely. This is the picture of a bride who's been loved by a groom and that love has made her lovely. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a wedding. You, been, you, got, you, you guys been to a wedding over here? We got one guy here been to a wedding? I bet your parents have been to a wedding. Hopefully they were at one a while ago, right? They, they were at a wedding. Been to a wedding and there's something crazy about a wedding. You go to a wedding and I don't know what it is, but for some reason when you go to a wedding, have you ever noticed this? How radiant the bride is? It's just kind of like this common phenomenon across all races and creeds and, and, and tribes. I've done a few, a few weddings myself, and I'm never, I'm just never, I never tire and never cease to be amazed at like how beautiful the bride is. And, and this isn't going to be a comment on weddings I've done, but even simple, common, homely, girls, I know I'm not thin eyes, aren't I? <laughs> Even unattractive women, according to the standards of the world, on their wedding day, radiate. They just do. And it's not because she spent 450 bucks having her nails done. And it's not because she spent 600 bucks getting her hair done. And it's not because she's in a dress that costs her... $7,000 she's going to wear for 45 minutes. It's because on that day, as she walks down the aisle looking at the man who has said, you are my bride, there's something about his love for her that draws out of her beauty she didn't even know was there. To be loved by a man who says, of all the women I could choose, of all the women I could pursue, I choose you to love you, to have you, to protect you, to provide for you, to lay down my life if necessary, sacrificially to ensure your good, to enjoy you, to be with you, to do life with you, to have kids with you, to raise a family with you, to hang out with you. I choose you and it draws out beauty from the depths of a woman she didn't even know was there. Terry grabbed me between second service. He said, you know, 
Genesis, God says, he spoke and it was, he said, he said, he said, which is all incredible. He said, and the stars came. He said, and the water came. He said, and the sun and moon came. And then it says, he got to Eve, and it says, he fashioned Eve. It's amazing to speak and it come true. But when he got to Eve, he's like, okay, let's just take our time here. It's craftsman time. And when he brought Eve to Adam, Adam was like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. There's something sweet and precious and radiant about a bride walking down to be taken into the arms of a lover who has said, you and you alone for me forever. Weddings are a lot of things. But at the bottom, weddings are about heaven. That's why they're a universally joyous occasion most of the time. (laughs) And it's broken down here and messed up down here. But weddings, people put aside stuff for weddings because this is a moment here. Weddings are about heaven. This isn't about a bride who's made herself lovely for a groom, but rather a bride who's been made lovely for her groom. And the groom's glory then becomes the bride's glory. This is mind-blowing. Look at this. Chapter 21, verse 11. And that city shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. Where else have we heard crystal used, in, crystal used in Revelation? Only one place, friends. Chapter 4, at the throne, John beholding the very radiance of God himself, so bright that he could not even look upon it. And now God's saying, oh, that glory is going to fill that city. God shares his glory with no one except the church at the end. And he fills all in all the people of God and his glory becomes their glory. His radiance becomes their radiance. His beauty becomes their beauty. His joy becomes their joy. They are made one. This is us. This is you if you're in Christ. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This is the prophetic consummation of that word. Interesting to know, we talked about the Bible, interpreting the Bible. This vision is actually the encapsulation and the distilling of the last eight chapters of Ezekiel. You read chapters 41 through 48 in Ezekiel, you realize that all the language that John's using here was taken from those chapters. And you get to the very, very end of the book of Ezekiel. I didn't tell us the first service. This is extra for you third service folks who are, who are Jesus' favorite. That's right. That's right. Yeah, amen. Yeah, this is third service, my crowd. Sleep in, get breakfast, hang out. It's describing the new, I invite, better invite the band. Yeah, the band's like, get out there, let's get them off stage. Come out, band, we'll, we'll wrap this up. It's describing the new city. And you know the last words of the book of Ezekiel are that this passage in Revelation is the prophetic fulfillment of? You know what the last words are? Here they are. And the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. (laughs) Uh, Will I be bored in heaven? (gasps) No. With the saints of old throughout all of human history enjoying the people of God in the place of God in the presence of God forever sharing in his 
joy and glory and power and rule and reign. Are you kidding me? Not locked inside some little stupid cube at the North Pole, enjoying all of the new heavens and the new earth because they've been united as one in Christ. The city of God is not a place we go someday. The city of God is the church. This is us. But the city of God now still dwells imperfectly among the city of men. We're not yet to the new heavens and new earth. We're still left on broken earth, old earth. But he is fashioning us as the church to be an echo and a foretaste of the city of God to come. You say, you know, how does it help me today, Josh? You're two minutes over. We got to be done. I'm a little confused here. I, I got to go back to work tomorrow with coworkers I don't like. I didn't hire. I can't fire. And I'm stuck with. I got to go on a sports team that's, that's pure. These people are just off the deep end. I got roommates. I got, I got a marriage, rough marriage. I got a t- Like, how is this going to help me? Number one. This vision of the church should give you hope. The church should be safe. What do you mean? This is a vision of the city of God as the bride of Christ representing the very people of God and they will be safe and secure forever. That's their destiny. Meaning, no matter what idiot walks in the back of a little chapel in Texas and spreads death and destruction for a few moments, that psychotic, deranged, evil man will not have the final word over the church. That in Christ, they are secure and they will be made safe forever. No bullets, no guns, no lions can touch this city, this bride, this people on that day. That'll help. There is no need to walk in fear. This is you. This is us. This is your destiny in Christ. How does this help me? It gives you hope. It gives you purpose. The church is his prize. The church is his prize. And you'll do lots of things in your life that are good and important and maybe even a part of your calling God's called you to do. Build things, draw things, create things, lead things, play things, construct things, organize things. God, God's given wonderful gifts to his people, to humanity. But whatever you're doing, you should always be about being a contributing member of the church because at the end of all times she's not just there as a spectator she's the spectacle (laughs) so whatever you do don't not invest fund, support, serve sacrifice for, build up love, pray over protect and work for the church You do lots of stuff in life. Come and go. Maybe it may not might, might matter. Maybe not. Maybe it won't matter. But you lean your shoulder into growing the church. You write as the subtitle to your purpose in life. I want to help more people meet, love, follow Jesus so they can be here. You will be living a life of significance, investing in that thing that God calls his prized possession on the last day of all time. And lastly, it will give you encouragement. We aren't made beautiful by merit, but by grace. Some are like, yeah, easy to say, love the church. You don't know my community group, you know, or you don't know my parents. You don't know my kids or whatever. No, 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 here's the deal. You should leave with a new resolve to never criticize the church again. You're critiquing the bride of Christ. Now, should false churches be shuttered? Yes. Should heretics be pointed out? Yes. Should doctrine be defended? Yes. Should should those who are in sin be brought discipline against and called to repent if they're wearing the t-shirt Team Jesus and living in a way contrary to his word? Yes, 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 and amen. I'm just saying don't be a grumbler against the church. 
Don't be a closet critic of the church. The church is his bride, and he loves his bride, and he takes it personal when people critique her. So let's, and I'm, I'm including myself in this bus, let's just resolve to be people of grace and patience with the church, this church, because sometimes I get frustrated with y'all and you get frustrated with me. What do we expect? This is broken version of me. And you're broken version of you and there's some newness breaking in, but there's better newness to come. I'm not yet what I'm supposed to be, but I will one day be all I was made to be and that's going to be a good day. And you'll be like, thank you very much finally and so will you be. And so we can have patience with each other knowing that one day God will complete the work, and he'll do that. We don't have to. But whatever we're found doing, we want to be found building up the church. Grace City Church. Grace City Church. We are on our way to living in a city, the very people of God, whose gates are the very embodiment of grace, And until then, we have been called to embody that grace to our broken city. We are on our way to a new and whole city, the city of God, with the people of God and the place of God. Until then, we are to be the embodiment of the city of God to the city of man we live in today. When you see a picture of heaven, hope, purpose, encouragement, It buoyed the saints of old in the face of lions. Do you have it? Father, we're grateful for this profound vision of us and what we will one day become. Not because we're amazing, not because we're lovely, but because you took the unlovely bride and with your love you made her radiant. Father, would you fill us with this kind of hope for the church? And Father, if there are those within the hearing of my voice or listening online or watching on the app, and and, and they are not citizens of that new city. They're not members of that city. That city is not their home. They are currently out in the weeds, out in the briar patch, out in the forest, out in the muck, out in the marsh, outside the city, wondering if they could make their way in. Would you show them this morning, Father, or whether they're sitting in a truck or a car or in traffic or at home or working out at the gym, wherever they're listening to this right now, Father, would you show them that there is a gate and his name is Jesus and there's an invitation on the table. And that invitation is to come, to lay down the burdens of guilt and shame to lay down the work of trying to make the unlovely lovable and to simply receive by faith the love of the groom, of Jesus Christ, that they too can begin the journey of becoming the beautiful bride to which he will finish his work in the end. Father, would you deposit in our heart, the church, a deep and abiding and lasting and sustaining passion to see more people meet and love and follow Jesus as a result of this small expression of the city of God living out the good news of the gospel and the hope that we have in Christ among the city of men we find ourselves living in today. For the glory of Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.